Joe Longthorne and Karen Lee Burnett. Faith, part two of two. Three wise men, a trio of heroes. These three dedicated doctors succeeded in keeping Joe alive for 30 years. During that time, he became progressively worse. First, in 1989, came lymphoma. Next, leukemia in 2006. And finally, throat cancer was diagnosed in 2014. We raised a million pounds for Lee's German Infirmary to help with the ward. Because when I was very ill in 1989, I think it was, I, I was quite ill with when it first came on me. And the shock I had was when I went for my first operation, I had to have a bath in some lukewarm water with that old brown soap. You know that old soap that a million people, do you know what they've used? Calabolic, is it cal Calabolic. Well, I, and an old curtain. And I thought, this has made me more depressed than even the d disease. So after that, I decided to sort of get a campaign going to alter the ward. So now in Leeds, German Infirmary on the Brotherington wing it is, it's all new beds, cubicles, da 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 da, da. So you feel... You know, you feel that's good. Not just I, of course, but the people that send their money in there. Just an inspiration to anybody who's suffered from cancer or anything. It gives you hope that, you, you know, you can keep fighting and you, you can come through it if you really believe that you'll get through it. I'd just like to say a few things about Joe, because uh, for many years since he came from Scarborough, he mentioned he wasn't very well and he came over to Leeds and... I think we did something for you at that time and got you on the road again. And uh, you've been a supporter of ours all those years at the infirmary. And I know you're in Blackpool now and you, you, you have a doctor over there as well. But uh, it's been a privilege looking after you all these years. And uh, I'd just like to say that we're very grateful also to your supporters over the years because some of them have sent presents. to us on various occasions, sometimes at your, your birthday, um, to, to support the unit. And why it's a special day today, I know it's a special day for you and for all the people here, but it's because very shortly we're going to sign the document, which means that we'll be hopefully getting this new wing, which will be based at St James's Hospital, which will be a new, what they call an oncology wing, but it'll have all the haematology there, which is the blood diseases unit. and. Uh, it's going to be wonderful because we're looking forward to that. It doesn't end until 2007, but, but our, our supporters, who you've supported, the, the charity, the friends of the uh, uh, lymphoma and leukemia unit at the infirmary, uh, are going to be supporting that venture because we can't do all the things. There's the equipment and all sorts of things, even the beds. The dear old, the dear old NHS can't provide the beds, so <laughs> we'll have to provide the beds as well. And. Um, We'll do all of that because we've had wonderful support. So once again, very many thanks, Joe. It's been terrific. Thank you. So we managed to get seven thousand pounds out there. You've got a lot. Thank you, Professor Cowley. We have, uh, Doctor, it's really, I know you're a very busy man and everything, but it's a real pleasure for, uh, we really do thank God you're here and thanks for looking after everybody as you do. It's, a, it's a great. Yeah. No, so thank you, my darling. We have a check there that we've raised while we've been doing our show and our buckets. Of course, all your wonderful helpers and all the audiences. And we put together a check for you for £8,580. Is that right? And, uh, and Dr. Kelsey, ladies and gentlemen, is actually going to be touring around Peru, is it, Doctor? Brazil. Brazil, um, on his bike. <laughs> Why he just didn't go to Fleetwood back, I'll never know. <laughs> but of course, he'll be raising money, ladies and gentlemen, for much needed research into uh, all the different blood diseases, dreadful diseases there are that we get all over the world. And this man not only. Um, helps cure people and keep people maintained but he actually gets on his bike to do it as well which is and that's a man 
So you go for you. We had a bit of. Uh, okay, we had we had we had, um, we had an uh, eBay thing, eBay, she eBay, where it's called on it, and we managed to um, to raise nine thousand seven hundred fifty-three pounds. And God love him, ladies and gentlemen, our wonderful priest here, Father Jeff, who is for the everybody. He's, uh, we, uh, we're going to put together a thousand pounds, ladies and gentlemen, for Father Jeff, because he goes over to, to places like Havana to help all these children who are in need of heart replacement operations and things, and things they need. And they do need it badly out there. And Father Jeff has got a thousand pounds. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Macmillan Cancer Relief, I would just like to thank all the audiences over the last nine weeks who have so generously donated to this wonderful final amount. Not quite final, because I'm hoping that you will be as kind tonight. I would also just like to pay tribute to the 56 Macmillan Cancer Relief volunteers who have helped me sustain this collection over nine weeks. For young people who staff the Opera House here for Leisure Parks who have also helped me. They've been great fun and they are now firm friends. Thank you. And finally, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, life is not measured by the number of breaths you take, but by the times your breath is taken away. Joe, you're truly inspirational. You're the finest ambassador for those living with cancer and you take our breath away a million times. Well, as you can hear behind me, the party is in full swing for one performer who has managed to fill the room with a whole host of famous faces for his very own Variety Club Trivia Night. The performer in question is a one and only Joe Longthorn, who despite suffering with cancer for 18 years, has now got the all clear and is on the stage right now. I wish him all the best. And I hope, you know, I'm very, very pleased to be along here this evening to see him. I'm looking forward to Joe singing and performing. I think the weird one, do you know why? Because he's like us, he's been up and he's been down, he's been on the bones and he's bounced back, he's been in bad health and he's bounced back. He's a true professional, of, he, he's worthy of the title what he's getting tonight. I think uh, it's a fairy tale for Joe and I think, I, I just hope he has a fantastic night because we all love him to death. Tell him! Yeah. The bar. Bragger! Do the other one, thanks. This is like a castle. Use a tan. Super. <laughs> of course, it's not often you see a lot of friends all together because most of the stars and celebrities that see it tonight are either doing their, their work that they've got to do. So it's not very often you get to meet together. So that's another a, a plus. I have to say, you're looking very well. How are you feeling at the moment? Great. I'm a little bit tipsy, but. Yeah. but, but, but <laughs> Well, aren't we all? <laughs> Entitled to be. Yes, I'm thrilled. And God bless everybody. Thank you very much indeed. Without the expertise of Dr. Lucas and the care by the staff of the Manchester Royal Infirmary, this could well have been our Joe's final show. <laughs> Next, the gentleman to whom Joe owes so very much. And because of that, so do we. He's a consultant hematologist at Manchester Royal Infirmary, Guy Lucas. Good evening, J Joe, Variety Club members, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It's, it's a pleasure to be here to give my tribute to Joe and to make it clear that it's a tribute also from all the doctors and nurses at Manchester Royal Infirmary. I, I have to confess this is slightly more serious than the previous, previous talk that you've had from Freddie Starr. Um, I first met Joe two years ago. Uh, many of you will know that he's battled with leukemia for many years. Now, uh, he'd, he'd struggled on, he'd gone through, he'd continued working despite life-threatening life complications, very intensive treatment. 
but it was clear by a couple of years ago that he was running out of options and the only thing that could help him was a bone marrow transplant. Unfortunately, there was no one in his family who was compatible, but we were able to find an unrelated donor. I was unable to promise him anything except a hard time. I couldn't give any guarantees, but, but he took it on the chin and came into hospital for his transplant. He had a dreadful time. He had a terrible time with a sore throat and sore mouth, and I did worry that it might affect his singing voice. And worst of all, he, he developed terrible chest problems and was unconscious on a breathing machine in the intensive care unit for over a month. But remarkably, he pulled through. I'm not quite sure why it is he pulled through, but he did, he did it was, I think, his steely determination uh, and iron resolve. I think we also have to say that the support of his family, his manager, Paul, and I think all the, the, the encouragement and good wishes that came from all his fans everywhere. But he came through it and spent nearly three months in hospital before transferring to Blackpool for another few weeks of convalescence and then took another few months to recover. And it was a pleasure to see last year that he was able to resume, resume singing and performing. And it's such a delight to see things going well for him. I'm too superstitious to use words like cure. I think you have to keep your fingers crossed, you have to light a candle, you have to, have to say a prayer to your favorite saint. But so far, things are going well. So Joe, my, my, my tribute to you uh, is from me and from Manchester Royal Infirmary. God bless, and the best is yet to come.
Joe's bone marrow procedure in 2006 was a complete success. Unfortunately, the fates once again transpired to be unfavorable because by 2014, his life was again threatened by the advent of throat cancer. This condition, unfortunately, proved to be insurmountable, even to one of our heroes of many previous victories. But that's the best service I've ever been to in my life. The four comics we got up and spoke were absolutely wonderful. It was full of laughter and joy. And that's what Joe was all about. And Joe, a friend to all, left our world in 2019, leaving it a far poorer place for his passing. We will never see his like again. Off comes the makeup, off comes the clown's disguise. The curtains fallen as the music softly dies. But I hope you're smiling. As you're filing out the door As they say in this business That's all there is, there isn't any more We've shared a moment Does this moment ends? I have got a funny feeling We're parting now as friends Your cheers and laughter to do again And the evening when you again I would spend it with you again But now the curtain falls You're Tears and so much laughter I gotta linger after They've torn down these dusty walls People say I was made for this And nothing else would I trade Just to think I get paid for this But now the curtain falls When quality audio and visuals combine, sometimes something unique and unforgettable is created. Karen sings from the heart. The effect is breathtaking and captivating. i 
As the lyrics of that lovely song suggest, there is a time and place for us. We do hope you will join us for the next hour or so. Please let me explain. Over the next few weeks, I'm going to be presenting a new television series with a difference for you, entitled The Beautiful Villages and Churches of England. It's going to feature history, tradition, architecture, amazing stories, music and songs. We hope you enjoy it. Just feeling away, lost in the dark, drawn to each other. I've waited all of my life to find someone who where the center of Winchelsea is. Choose a few reddened faces. They would probably say the local pub. But the vast majority would say our magnificent church. And they wouldn't be wrong. Here's the church of St. Thomas the Martyr. This stunning old medieval church built in 1288 was named in commemoration of the victim of one of the most treacherous acts in English history the slaying of Thomas Becket, the Archbishop of Canterbury. He was slain on the steps of his own cathedral by the King's men in 1170. Winchelsea attracts many overseas visitors. I'm now speaking to John Rodley, who's one of the wardens of the church here. Um, we're going to be talking about this actual particular gravestone, which was um, the famous Pike Milligan. Could you tell us more about it, John? Yes, well, here he is. I mean, he's in here. Why he's here, uh, we, we're not quite sure, because right. he, he lived a little way outside of the town in Udemore. Mm. I believe he was a Roman Catholic. This, of course, is a church of England exactly. church. But uh, yes. anyway, however he managed it, here he is. And uh, it's uh, it's obviously very popular with the tourists. It helps the church a lot. A lot of, uh, a lot of visitors uh, 
come in specifically, specifically to see, to see yes, this. and then come into the church, and that's yeah. enormously helpful. So it's as a big well. draw for it him. It is, yes. it is. And uh, well, it's nice to have him here, I guess. I think so. Here. Yes, yeah. I think so. Absolutely. Karen, we're just sort of emerging from the ruined north transept of the uh, of the church. It yes. was uh, it was commenced or commissioned in uh, in uh, 1280 and uh, completed, we think, in about uh, 13, 13, 13, 14. How much was actually completed is uh, is still open to uh, to some doubt, and we'll see the ruins as we go on wrong. But the bit that we're looking at now is the uh, is it were the complete and uh, an original part and you'll see the external buttresses here the yes. decoration on the windows it's very Beautiful, much in the style of the um of the early decorated period of uh, of architecture yes quite interesting flying buttresses that uh, fall off on the uh, on the side here the, and that's the usual sort of design that you get is it with these sort of very very much so and yeah. i mean the, 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 it's not that common in a in a parish church and i mean although I have to say Rye is very similar, but um, it, the fact is that, as we'll see, this was built very much on cathedral, Basis. cathedral scale, yes, rather than just it's a huge, parish isn't church it? scale. Absolutely it is enormous. very large indeed. And then, I mean, obviously the sun does start, does it come round here in the mornings? So the, the, It is marvellous inside the church, and that, that window looks due east, so right. on a morning, well, not this morning, but I mean, when, when we've got a sky like this in the morning, the sun comes up. And that's where it's shining through, beautiful. Yes, we do. That's yeah, a good I'd idea. like to yeah. see you inside. Yeah. That would be great. Yeah. Thank you. This entrance of the church is the Tudor porch, which was a later addition in the early 1500s. You will notice the Tudor rose that Henry VII used as a symbol to unite England after the War of the Roses. White against red, House of York of the legitimate claim against the House of Lancaster, the usurpers, who eventually prevailed. The Tudor Rose gave birth to the House of Tudor of Henry VIII and his daughter Elizabeth I. The Tudors reigned over the country from 1485 to 1603. It proved to be a prosperous period. Elizabeth I visited the town regularly. 
often praising the residents and remarking that the town was like Little London. More recent royal visitors were King George VI, the Queen Mother, and their daughter, our present Queen, then Princess Elizabeth, who as monarch was to visit on a further three occasions. Beautiful already. Yes. John, what a beautiful church. Isn't it lovely? It is. It's, uh, it's, it's quite, quite striking. Let me just close the door yes, so you get a better, yes. uh, better view of, uh, of things. Good I, grief. I think you're right. I mean, what strikes the immediate contrast, I think, is when you're on the outside, you're looking at what looks like a ruin. Yes. And when you come in, you are surrounded it's by perfect. so much magnificence yes. that it's uh, that it's untrue. And yeah. you just um, really the light that comes through that uh, that great east window in the mm. morning is is magnificent. And uh, you see the colours. To some people's taste, the blue is is too strong, but I think it's I quite think magical. It's and and what what do you see in the church generally? If it's if it's made of stone, yeah, then it's original. Right. If it's wood, yes. it's newer. Yeah. I mean, the pews weren't here when it went in, obviously, and the roof is... Uh, well, I'm told there are some beams up there that apparently date from the 1600s, but I don't think there's anything that's absolutely original with right. the church there. But the stone is. Stone is. And yeah. do you see examples here of cornstone, uh, Purbeck stone, um, local ironstone, um, and uh, Sussex and Perbeck marble as well. There's the various contrasts. See, there's quite a lot of different contrasts yeah, in is. the texture beautiful. of the stone. But the windows are actually much newer, and they went in in between 1928 and 1931. Oh right, recently, really. All done. Yeah, quite recently. <laughs> right. Yeah. And uh, yeah. all done as a set by a, a, a well-known Scottish stained glass called uh, Douglas Straw. Mm. And um, and they do actually sort of uh, there's a theme that runs round the the windows on on that side mm. the, uh, the the north side of the church are known as the elemental windows and uh, you see there that represents earth right the centre one is wind and fire yeah and the right hand one is is water Winter. so those are the elements right. the wind and fire window is is one of the famous ones because it's also the uh, the, the war memorial window and uh, uh -huh. a little bit more of that in a second yeah okay and it was consecrated in the uh, when it went in by archbishop lang who was then the archbishop of canterbury so it was, a, right. it was an important window in that sense mm -hmm. and quite interesting the lower um, um, part of that window the bottom right hand corner there's all sorts of little things in all of these windows yes. but it depicts a sort of Belgian village during the First yes. World War. And the soldiers um, at the bottom. And the soldiers at the yeah. bottom there. It's, uh, it's, yeah. it's interesting. The, the big windows at the, at the, at the end um, represent um, birth on right. the left-hand side, uh, death mm. on the right-hand side, and uh, resurrection and uh, ultimate glory being the great central window window just there. South side here, yeah. um, we've got uh, the theme is Christ as, as a teacher, Christ as healer, and a famous window there being the lifeboat mm -hmm. window, which commemorates the Mary Stanford disaster in 1926, right. with the names of the lifeboat men at the bottom. That again was consecrated by uh, Archbishop Lang. The residents of Rye and its neighbouring town of Winchelsea have witnessed many tragedies together over the last thousand years or so. There was the Black Death in the 1300s, and they also fought together to rout French and Spanish invaders with major loss of life. But the Mary Stanford disaster was perhaps the most harrowing of all. St Thomas Church in Winchelsea had a stained glass window installed in reverence to the sacrifice of the Rye Martyrs to the Sea. On a freezing November morning in 1928, the residents of the town of Rye in East Sussex struggled in 80 to 90 miles per hour gales at 5 a.m. along the Shingle Beach to a small RNLI lifeboat station, which housed an even smaller boat. Within 72 hours, the names of the 17 crew would be on everyone's lips worldwide. The reason for the gathering being a distress call from a foreign ship, sinking in terrible gales in the English Channel. It was low tide in Rye Bay and the launching party, both men and women from the town, had to drag the four tonne boat 300 yards on the shingle beach down to the water's edge. 
Conditions were so appalling, it took three exhausting attempts before the lifeboat was seaborne. By now, the time was 6.31 a.m. The courageous crew, already soaked to the skin, began to row. Yes, row. The Mary Stanford was an open rowing boat with no mechanical power. There were 14 compartments for the bravest of the brave to stand within and row. An awful irony was to be revealed later. 30 minutes after they took to the sea, at around 7 a.m., recall flares were fired to bring the crew home. These brave sons of Rye never saw the flares. The crew huddled together in heavy seas, probably shipping water at this time. Their efforts were fully focused upon survival. The raw force of nature threw 40 to 50 foot mountains of water at them every minute or so. For four hours they fought ferocious conditions of unimaginable horror, the worst in living memory. Every man fought so gallantly to survive, whilst attempting to fulfil their mission, occasionally they were seen from the shore some four miles out. Then, at 10.30am, a witness saw the boat succumb to a huge wave. The Mary Stanford capsized and flipped over. Within the hour, she was washed up and upturned at the feet of the awaiting rescuers in Rye Bay. When righted, two bodies were discovered entangled in the debris. Tragically, over the next three hours, the sea returned 13 more of the 17 gallant lost souls of Rye. Another crewman was given up by the sea some three months later. Distressingly, the 17th crew member was never recovered. The Daily Mirror covered the disaster and it made front page news. It still remains the worst loss of life from an RNLI station in its near 200 year long history. The photos depict the stricken boat, one of it being launched and the sad sight of one of the victims receiving emergency resuscitation, as they all did, but unfortunately to no avail. The vast sum of 35,000 pounds, maybe two million today, was donated by patrons to help support the victims' families and to erect an everlasting memorial to the now immortal sons of Rye. The most harrowing aspect of this unprecedented loss of life from one lifeboat station is the fact that among the 17 crewmen there were four sets of brothers, including two sets of three. The 17 and many others have over the years given everything. When you walk through a storm, hold your head up high and don't be afraid of the dark. At the a golden sky and the sweet silver song of a lie. Walk on through the wind, walk on
So right. the, the windows themselves are magnificent. All sorts of yeah. fascinating little bits in them. I mean, there's Edward the First there, yes. according the, uh, the the charter for the church being built, and uh, the children love spotting little things like the monkey in the uh, in the yeah. centre right hand window there. And this is what you do with the children. Yeah, it's, it's, it's good. There's all sorts of there's so many there. little things for them to uh, to look at. Mm. Um, I mean, away from the from the windows. I suppose yeah. we we should say that uh, what we're looking at in this in this building is in effect the what was known as the choir nave. And I mentioned outside yes. that that was the rude screen. Public beyond that. Yes. In here was the uh, was the professional clergy and the monks who would have uh, supported it, and they would have um, they would have formed a, a choir in the centre part of the church. There on mm -hmm. either side were these two side chapels, right. which were set up also as, as chantries, right. places where they would chant for the souls of the departed. Yeah. And there are three um, tombs. I believe for every drop of rain that falls a flower grows I believe that somewhere in the darkest night a candle glows I believe above the storm the smallest prayer will still be heard I believe that someone
This is Wesley Chapel, erected by the residents of Winchelsea to commemorate the visit of John Wesley, the founding father of the Methodist faith. In one appearance, he won the village people over. They took him into their hearts. What more can one say about this man? He inspired millions. Whom can you compare him with? The answer is probably no one. He was a one-off. In the history of English-speaking working-class people, he had no equal. His flock today is 70 million strong worldwide. I'm now speaking to Barry Turnwell, who's the representative of the Methodist Chapel. I'd like to ask you some questions, Barry, about this chapel. It's beautiful. It is indeed, yes. It dates back to 1785, which is when it was built. John Wesley came to this town of Winchelsea in 1771, and he preached outdoors, and uh, lots of people gathered around to see him. And when they had left, John Wesley had left, they felt that they'd like to build an actual chapel here. And this was built in 1785. So what was, the re what was the reason why he, why did he preach outside? He preached outside because although he was a priest in the Anglican Church, uh, the message he was giving out, he was not allowed to preach in Anglican churches right. because he very much sided with the working man and woman, right. the farmer, the fisherman and so on. Mm. And at that time, the Anglican Church was uh, full of the squires, the landowners. Right. And the message that John Wesley was preaching was not very acceptable. So he preached in the open air. Mm -hmm. And subsequently, Methodist churches grew up. And this one did in 1785. Uh, the, the, it was purchased from the person who lives in the house next door, lived in those days. He gave this land, in fact, for this small chapel to be built. It is more technically called a preaching house. Right. Because in those days, sermons were not... 10 or 15 minutes, they were perhaps an hour. Yeah. And the pulpit that we have in the chapel here is the pulpit that John Wesley actually preached from. So that's, in a way, its claim to fame. And it is here. actually the original pulpit. The original pulpit from which he preached. As you can see, it comes out into the chapel yeah. and it's quite high. And in those days, it was very much about preaching God's word and mm. it was to be seen uh, to be so you witnessed could... there. You so you could, could throw yourself, yes, yes, absolutely. Yes. And, uh, and then subsequently, um, John Wesley, of course, went round all sorts of visits and he came back in 1790 and there is an ash tree outside of the grounds of the parish church mm -hmm. and that is a, a, a cutting from the original ash tree under which John Wesley preached his last open-air sermon in 1790. He had to sit down because he was a very old man. Right. He died less than six months uh, later. Yeah. Uh, and ever since there's been this chapel here, um, we have a little committee that looks after it. We have an event once a month of some mm -hmm. sort, a service or a festival or an open day. Uh, and we have about 80 or 90 people who are That's friends lovely. of the chapel. And we try to look after it. And we quite recently have done some work to make it look a little bit uh, smarter. It's beautiful. It's beautifully pre preserved, isn't it? It is. And it it's is, got a lovely yes. view. Yeah. Yes, the road. lovely. And obviously that busy road wasn't here when no, it was built. No, the 8259 was not there. No. But in, in the 1700s, it was like a track, really. Right. And of course, John Wesley rode everywhere by horse. Yeah. In his lifetime, he apparently rode 250,000 miles on horseback. And he was writing his sermons at the same time. And mm. uh, thinking what he was going to say, and so the horses would be hitched up outside, mm. and in would come the people. And this would be absolutely crowded. Yeah. There wouldn't be any of the furniture that we see here. Mm. Um, it would just be an ordinary basic floor. And people and standing. Crowded. Yeah, and outside the door, because mm. he was such a popular, charismatic man. Yeah, he sounded as if he following. was a people's person. He was. He yeah. identified with what we would call the working, working class. class. Yeah. Uh, and not with the squires and landowners mm. and, and people like that. And of course his brother, who Charles Wesley, mm. was the great hymn writer. He wrote mm. over 6,000 hymns. Mm. Well, great you. preachers of this age come here and stand and preach yeah. and they love to stand here. Particularly American people, of course, for whom course. this is a marvellous yeah. centre to do with uh, Methodism mm. and John Wesley. And John Wesley kept a journal uh, of his, much of his life and it's actually recorded the exact dates where he was preaching, where he visited. 
a bit like Samuel Pepys kept yes. a diary. Yes. So John Wesley kept what is called a journal and we have copies of that uh, so you can tell where he was at certain times. Fascinating. And even the, the very date that he came to Winchelsea, which he visited three times, we know, at least three times. Three he times, came to, okay. came to this town, very yeah. often on his way to Rye, which is just down the road. Yeah, lovely. Thank you very much. That's oh. so interesting. That's My lovely. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. two wonderful albums available, With All My Heart and All Of My Life. If you're interested, please contact Terry Lodge on 07301 107744. With All My Heart, 12 beautiful songs. All of my life, 14 wonderful songs. We'd like to dedicate this production to the late Alan Wormald and James Kimbarry Widdowson, otherwise known as Barry.